so much for that lovely introduction. I'm excited, but I'm also a bit terrified. And these walls are um, intoxicating, aren't they? <laughs> um, so thank you also. Just, it was lovely to hear the other commission poets who I admire so much. Well, I'm really looking forward to your book that's coming out next year with Granta. Um, so I'll read the commissioned poem first. Uh, i just say a little bit about it. It's called Gateway to India. Um, I'm a daughter of immigrants. My parents came from the Punjab in India in the 1960s. My dad, my ship, my mother, later my plane. And although they come from the Punjab, the last port that my, my father left from was actually, um, it was Bombay, now called Mumbai. And so it's a city that's very important, but also it's a city that he never returned to. But I returned to last year, um, and I went to the Gateway of India at 7 o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day, and that sort of seeded this poem, Gateway of India. It's early, the traffic volume is still low, Kismet coaches are arriving as I pass the sweepers along the railings, the chai wallers stacking their perspex cups, smoking their morning beadies, and I pass the still sleeping bodies, a man using the foam of his flip flops for a pillow, a few beggars rising from the smoke. Around the perimeter of the snack shops are selling juice, phone cards, and triple blade razors. I step aside to avoid the speedy boys in their brown and cream uniforms, their wire trolleys straining under the weight of the packages. The ladies' entrance is closed this morning, so I join the one easy moving queue behind a woman wearing a death before decaf t shirt, and after security, incongruously step on a little patch of carpet that welcomes me into the square. Under the triumphant arch, a row of apertures are filled with pigeons standing like sentry guards, each of their ragged backs against the Arabian Sea. These most revolutionary of birds are as maddening here as in any other city. The birds own this place. The pigeons and the gulls that swarm in batches not unlike starlings over the turrets of the old basalt gate, the harbour water, and around the hotel. The Taj has erected anti roosting spikes, aviary netting, and every conceivable device, but these birds are insistent as the Indian sun, which now disrobes itself from the clouds, as the Mumbai morning comes fully into the square. The last battalion of British troops left this spot in 1948. Two decades later, and less than a mile from here, my father set sail on an Italian ship. Book. I realise that many of the poems, even the ones that aren't 
overtly about my brother, I sort of rinsed in this blue loss and sorrow. So um, on the on the way here, I because I'm quite I'm very sort of terrified of reading the book for the first time in some ways and excited as well. Um, I sent a text to my friend saying, "Oh gosh, I'm going to read these really sad poems," and she said, "Well, they're not coming to singing in the rain, are they?" <laughs> so um, I'll start with the title poem. Dear Big Gods, Dear Big Gods, All you have to do is show yourself. In case you hear us, we are so small and fenceless in the shade. Throw us a hook when you can. Touch the scribbled child in the inferno. All you have to do is show yourself a little. Pin your dark olive green parts against the boulder. This is the lilies. The lilies were sick. I was new and wifely. The first tiny garden and my favourite flower, right by the back door. They had been planted in raised beds, all self-conscious in their outsized whiteness. For weeks they seemed fine, but then I noticed a kind of injury, perforations on the petals and a black, sticky gold. The flies, excrement. I cleaned them up as best I could, but the blight returned. In the dark, with the kitchen lit, they must have peered in, their occultish, hurting faces, pressed against the glass. They were hard to love back, these flowers. I gave them nothing else, spared them my gaze, those poor, dazed heads. I suppose I could have pulled up their sick stems, or poisoned them, from the bottle, but I let them live on, beauty drained, in their altar beds. This one is called Grief Holds a Cup of Tea. She balances a saucer on her lap and confides, I've had surgery on my lips, but is it too much? Have I ever done it this time? The king died and the queen died is a story, says a writer. The king died, then the queen died of grief is a plot. But who will supervise my departure, she asks. Who will pack my valise? In the garden, she prepares the soil by sterilizing it with boiling water. She repudiates moles with her spit stance pose. She spent 10,000 hours perfecting this bendy technique. She borrows a ladder and removes the glazing pins from the book-sized panes of the greenhouse, and one by one the ancient glass panels lose their footing from the grey putty. She hands out stickers in the car park, keeps off the grass, and gives me a pair of raw blue slacks I don't know what to do with. Grief passes hard vows through a small, frameless window and snags on the painted ledge. Uh, the next poem is called The Wasps, and um, it's about my brother um, and wasps, and everyone has a wasp memory, and this is one wasp memory. The Wasp. Suddenly, they were on him. He was ten. The cricket game abandoned, but already they drizzled over his limbs, plunging into his ears, his eyes, trying to break into his body. The children stood around him, screaming, stamping them out, though he didn't howl or stagger even. He was shaking his head, moving his arms, swiping in wide semicircles in some horrible dance, just blind panic, adrenaline. His hair was on fire. His dark, 
boyfriend, lit by their frenzy as these maniacal creatures, this colony, loaded with pheromones, ruffled round his neck. I was crying, held back by an aunt, till someone bought the hose pipe and drowned the ball. His lips were blue, red, swollen, the ball still in the nest as the sober boy stood dripping into the soil, into their soused bodies, spent. Is everyone all right? Um, so I'm going to read two more short poems and then I'm going to read a long poem at the end. Um, so, you know, when you lose somebody suddenly, you feel like you see them all the time. And I suppose this is one of those situations where I, they sort of bloom like ghosts in the peripheral, your peripheral vision and you realise it's not them. But you have this kind of moment and then, and then you realise it. And it feels very strange when you have those moments and, and they sort of lessen and then suddenly maybe five, six years you'll have one again and you realise you haven't really prepared for it. This is one of those poems. When your brother steps into your Piccadilly westbound train carriage. You do not stare or question him about the afterlife, those mythical pairs, the balconies, and the how the fuck could you? You give up your seat, lean forward to touch the hem of his denim shirt, pull gently on his headphone wires, then say, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Because you left no note, because you left no note, I've invented one instead. You can ruin yourself with words. The pulse taps out ampersands. Ask anyone who's experienced birth pangs or reverse birth pangs. And find your interregna in the rubbish bin with the secret ingredient for gunpowder. I skin and etc. and smoke it. Return the shiver to the air. Okay, I'll read you one last poem, which is a, a giant poem, actually. It's a, a long-limbed poem, and uh, so you have to turn the book. And it's kind of um, a poem that arrived, um, I think I've had the last one. see if I have it, because it's so long. I'm going to get a very, very dry throat. <laughs> this is a tornado poem. It's one of those poems that just, I wrote it when I was running, uh, it came towards me, I saw its face, and it was a very angry face poem. And I realised that this was a, 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 a poem that I couldn't really govern, it was ungovernable. And I wrote it down very, very quickly in long lines, and I tried to make it shorter so it would fit into this little book, but it wouldn't. And in lots of other ways it wouldn't behave itself. Um, and I realised that I just had to respect what the poem was trying to do. And um, I'll just read it to you. It's the last poem. Five year update. I hope it's fine to contact you to tell you that I still watch the gaps in the carriages and listen out for the service has been a disrupted announcement for some other poor sisters' new news. Five years ago, the American women overheard my call just before Colchester. They passed bottles of water and granola bars to my seat. Three women in their 60s, each with the same face powder. It's always the daughters, they say. It's always the same graffiti over the bridge when you pass in the rain. Decades later, though, most insects are content to fly through raindrops, so I've heard. As for the humming living, while we are still standing in the polluted shade, what's under us, the choked up sap, retreats back into the soil, and there's us, maggot blind, walking into rooms backwards, pacing, all. Diligently pursuing our junky little grief now, stalking those roly poly sour living, reading under the patio table. Yes, 
Acceptance was something I believed in, but all of a sudden you are lying down and you are no longer tall, but long. Not to mention your arm that mechanically pokes out of my dream, like it's fishing. No one profits from pitchy memory apart from Nepenthe's twisted therapist since you've gone to ashes now, and we turn the box into the water of the Thames near the Greywood crying. Standing under a low roof, dirty in a window with our dirty hands, we've turned your trainers, south facing into the indigo night, rest assured, my bony breath brother. Voices, voices, hence this update. Remember how we counted yellow cars in our Fiat 128? But what's your perfect cure now, O oh, supersonic boy? Your judge dread, crime plague future's gone to waste. I can't help but curse what but better use for breath, you might say. And I don't know about you, but I've left part of myself in Inwood Park, posing up to a gold dog in the sunshine, but only after we rode and you'd practice your canters and the so green grass for the benches. Which part of you was left there? The Egyptians, they have a name for it. I've been wearing my extravagant robes with the hems ruptured, the cord tied, oh so loosely. How many breaths in later I've got older but smaller, I've gone down one lump, not two. I still don't swim, and yes, I still can't take a photograph. I see your face from time to time, especially on trains, where it flashes up on the airway, just before we slow right down. I reach for the door handle, alight, and run to the barriers. Thank you.